I'll um, answer um, Robert's um, question first. Um, um, although Robert, you know, I, I'll, I'll rephrase it here. I mean, but if I miss a part of it, you know, correct me and make sure I get all of the elements of it. Um, the, when the um, when Polk's brigade pushes over this um, crest that we're on now and down the slope in front of us towards the uh, the federal line and has halted, did they stay there? And that the answer is no. They fell back to the crest of this low rise that we're on now and laid down. Um, and they conduct a firefight with the Federals between here, the line we're on now, and the Federal line to our front. Unfortunately, right here, the cedars are too thick for us to, um, to be able to see the monuments or vehicles up on um, Battle Line Road. Now, with a little bit of spitting rain right now, we might get really lucky and some vehicle with its headlights on might go down the road. You might be able to um, to see that um, a little bit. So, But you all now are in the line of um, uh, Colonel George H. Nixon's 6th Company, um, 48th Tennessee Infantry. Um, and um, um, I am, um, th this is one of, um, of the the many um, research projects that um, that fill up boxes and uh, file cabinets um, in my uh, my library at um, at home. Um, I've looked, um, spent a lot of time looking at this regiment, um, and the handout is um, from one of the talks I do on um, on this, what I call um, "Broken Fortunes in the Valley of the River of Death." Um, the um, and so if you start with the side that's got the map of Tennessee on it and Broken Fortunes as the title, um, you can see the strength of that small six company regiment on both the 19th and 20th. Um, the um, 155 men on the 19th, they have five casualties in the night attack. And then 150 men, Colonel Nixon says, on the, um, on the 20th. And you can see the casualties as officially reported. Um, and then, um, based on um, some papers that um, were at the time, I got copies of them in private hands. Um, and also going through all of the service records, um, I've been able to, um, to work out the casualties in more detail for, um, for this, um, this regiment. Um, and that's what you, um, you see here. Um, the official casualties um, by company killed, wounded, and missing are listed there um, and um, and that uh, officially they have 76 casualties um, the um, um, uh, but by going through the um, uh, the compiled service records and other sources family histories um, and the like the um, can actually change the um, uh, the casualty figures there a little bit more and add five more men as casualties to, um, uh, to the regiment. Um, why those five men are not listed, um, one or two I can, um, can say, and I'll say a little bit about one of them in a few minutes, but why some of them are not listed, I don't know. One of the fellows um, was wounded in the leg and suffered the amputation of the leg. He is not on the official casualty list, um, but of course he no longer serves as a result of that, um, that amputation. So um, the, um, and then um, another little breakdown of the casualties um, by, um, uh, by relating those who were um, are killed outright, outright um, those who were mortally wounded and die um, of their, um, their wounds, um, mortally wounded, um, uh, dying within just a short time of um, their injury, dying of wounds within a few days um, of that, and then the, uh, the wounded, the number of them uh, who return, um, and um, uh, the one um, officially reported missing is the sergeant major of the regiment. And if you look at the table on the right-hand side, casualties reflected by annotation, you'll notice there's no one listed as missing, but there's one listed as deserted. The sergeant major reported missing actually deserted, went into Union lines um, a week or so after the battle. So. Um, but um, you know, those are just numbers. If you look now at the other side of the, um, of the paper, 
This is just one company, a Murray County um, uh, company. And it, um, um, the, based on the compiled service records, these other documents that I got from, um, uh, from different, um, different, or from a, they were private, in private hands at the time, I got some copies of them. Um, the, um, can look at, um, at that, uh, that one company. Um, of the 34 men who are listed there, I've been able to determine the age of 29 of those 34. Um, the average age was 25. The median age was 23. There were two soldiers under 18, Benjamin Thomas Martin and, um, and um, uh, Thomas B. Hill. Um, Martin was 17 and Hill was just 15. Um, the um, uh, 14 of the 29 were um, within the, uh, that age bracket that you always hear me mention for Civil War soldiers, 18 to 25 um, years of age. 13 were older than 26, four were over 30, and the oldest one, um, Fountain Hunt, was 44 years of, um, of age. 27 were Tennesseans, there was one North Carolinian, No, no cheer for North Carolina. Um, the, um, and one from Illinois. Um, <laughs> nothing worse, nothing worse than a rogue Illinois. <laughs> he was an Irishman. James C. Old Betsy Stamps. He could do ventriloquism. He could throw his voice. And around camp, he used to make inanimate objects talk. Um, I get it now. He was kicked out of Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, he was Irish, so... Um, um, the, um, um, and, um, and in, um, in uh, parade, in formation, there often would all of a sudden be some snide remark about an officer from somewhere along the line. It was James C. Old Betsy Stamp throwing his voice. That dog won't hunt. Um, 16 of the 34 were um, original members of the, of the company when it was organized in December. Um, the um, um, 26 were from Murray, Murray County, um, two more were from Lewis County, uh, but Lewis had in part been broken off from Murray in the 1840s, so they, um, they probably had uh, Murray County roots um, uh, to begin with. Um, Ten of them were, uh, were, were heads of households themselves uh, in the 1860 census. Twelve of them lived with their parents, one lived with their widowed mother, um, and um, one other lived with another family member, his grandfather. There were two boarders who boarded with their employers, and there was one orphan, that Thomas B. Hill, who lived with the man who was assigned by the court as his, um, his guardian. Um, Twelve were married, um, ten um, had children, for a total of 19 children. There were 16 who were single. One soldier, Martin Logan Martin, was just um, 12 days short of his first anniversary on September the 20th. Um, 11 farmers, seven farm laborers, four overseers for a total of 22 of the 34 in agriculture, two shoemakers, one house carpenter, one rock blaster um, and laborer. That's James C. Old Betsy Stamps. Um, the um, um, nine of them um, rented land. Um, nine of them lived with parents who owned land. Three of them owned land themselves. Um, Seventeen of them were unassociated with slavery. They did not own slaves. They did not live in a family that owned slaves. Um, the um, uh, but there were um, there was uh, one from a slave owning um, 
uh, family. Um, the uh, I'm sorry, eight from slave-owning families. One owned slaves himself, um, and as I said, four were overseers. Um, at least 16 of the 34 had had some um, some schooling. Um, the um, uh, none of the um, uh, the others were marked on the 1860 census as illiterate. So they probably all had some, um, some schooling, um, but have specific indication of schooling for, uh, for 16 of them. Um, there were um, pairs of brothers, the Reeses, Hodges, Estes, and Martins. Um, there was one father's son, the two Hunts, and um, uh, the McKennons were related in, um, in some fashion. These are really men of, um, of the 9th and 10th civil districts from just to the west of Columbia, Tennessee, um, and just south of the, um, of the Duck River. And they come forward in, um, in this action um, and are going to, um, uh, to uh, suffer um, as a result. You can see on the, uh, the, fir the other side the, uh, the casualties that just this, um, this one company um, uh, suffers. Um, First Lieutenant um, Elijah Patterson Parsons um, will be, uh, be wounded in the scrotum in this fight. He'll be admitted to the Floyd or Oak Bogey Hospital in Macon, Georgia on September the 24th and in November or December he was transferred to a hospital in Montgomery, Alabama and was still in Montgomery as of January 5, 1864. He returned to duty with the company sometime after um, that date, but before the end of February 1864. However, um, it is noted that he was not much military service afterwards. With a hybrid war. Um, but he stayed through the war, um, was still with the company in the spring of 64, but by September of 64, he was reported absent due to the wound he'd received at Chickamauga. In October of 64, he was not with the company, uh, but was in Macon, and then in, um, in May of 1865, he was paroled in Meridian, Mississippi. So his wound here will largely take him out of the, the war. Second Lieutenant William A. Reese, age 34. He is one of the men officially, not officially reported as wounded. But in this advance, and it, or the fight on this ground, um, he is going to be injured when a projectile cut off, or when an artillery projectile cut a limb off of a tree above him, and the limb fell and knocked him unconscious for a time. Is he a casualty? Yeah. At least for a few minutes, yeah. is the company absent his potential leadership? Um, so I included him as an additional casualty for Company E. Um, oh, and I should say, um, uh, while I don't know exactly where everybody stood in the, um, in the company, um, the, the position of the lieutenants, sergeants, corporals is all based on Hardy's tactics. Um, the, uh, the privates are just listed um, alphabetically, um, uh, but, um, uh, but at least for some, uh, you have some sense of where they were in the company line. Third Lieutenant George Washington uh, Mabry, age 28, was wounded by a bombshell in the leg. Hospitalized in Macon in, into November 63, he returned to duty sometime by the end of December, um, and may have been re-hospitalized due to that injury in July of 1864. First Sergeant William Kennedy Estes, standing behind um, Captain James Carlisle Cooper um, on the right of the company line. Uh, First Sergeant Estes, age 19, was mortally wounded. Um, he was struck by a mini ball um, that, hit, that uh, struck him over the right eye. It entered his skull and bulged out the base of, the, of his brain. He died on September the 21st. The blood from the wound staining the diary carried in his um, pocket that survived into at least the middle of the 20th century for a typescript to be made from it. Not um, haven't been able to locate the uh, the diary um, uh, since, but um, but they, there is a um, typescript of it. Second Corporal James C. Old Betsy Stamps, age 32, the Illinoisan, the Irishman, the ventriloquist. He's wounded in the body, but he returns to duty by the end of October. Tom, Private Thomas Gibson is wounded on September the 20th, 
hospital hospitalized, furloughed for 20 days from Montgomery. As late as the end of February 64, he had not returned to duty, although he um, uh, apparently did sometime thereafter. Another of the um, uh, killed is Private Marcus Logan Martin, who had, um, had started out uh, in the, early in the war in another unit and then transferred to this company to be with his um, younger brother. Um, Private Martin Logan Martin is, um, is struck by a, um, a mini ball um, and, um, and seriously injured. He's struck in the neck. Um, he and his younger brother, um, Benjamin Thomas Martin, are apparently um, close enough to one another along the company battle line that Benjamin Thomas Martin takes his wounded older brother into his arms um, and is holding him apparently at the time of his death. But Benjamin Thomas Martin did not survive unscathed himself. He is wounded by a mini ball in the left groin. The ball entered, leaving the femoral um, vessels to the outer side and, and um, entered about two inches, two and a half inches below the uh, Pupat's um, ligament, passing through, fracturing portions of, um, the, um, uh, of the pelvis, the lower uh, portion of the pelvis, and coming out about three inches from the anus and about two inches from the anal fissure. Um, hospitalized at both Lumpkin and Polk hospitals in Rome, Georgia, and still there as late as January, the end of January 1864, um, and certified by the surgeon in charge that he was of no further service. The entrance and exit points show depression surrounded by hardened tissue with evidence of sloughing. He tells me, says the doctor, that he had gangrene in the wound and many pieces of bone passed for two years or more before it healed. Mm -hmm. I, the, um, uh, the surgeon um, uh, that, who's examining for a pension after the war, um, I noticed scars below the wound as evidence of having abscesses open. From the character of the wound, um, I think he would be unfit for service for a long time, if ever. He was furloughed from the hospital in Montgomery, um, Alabama um, about September 5, 1864, and was home disabled at the, uh, the close of the war. He never married. Just one company in this battle. Somewhere along this line, between my marker on the right down here and my maps on the left. I've never been able to figure out the order of the companies um, along the, uh, the regimental line. Questions or observations? You, this could be done with um, with just about any of the uh, the units here um, the, um, to to really put a human face on um, on the cost um, of this battle, and for some units in even much more detail than um, than what I have done uh, done with this. It's amazing work. That is, yeah. And all of you will be assigned a unit for next year. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, what happened to the guy who threw his voice? Um, uh, stamps um, kind of disappears. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> he was also a magician. He said, I'm out of here. Yeah. He, um, <laughs> you know, he um, uh, was an Irishman. He was from Illinois. Um, um, he actually appears on the 1860 census twice. But, um, but being a rock worker, um, I can see how that um, that happened, and uh, he's sentenced, sentenced in two different civil districts about a week or ten days apart. Uh, he probably was sentenced in um, in the first one um, and finished that job, and uh, was working on somebody else's farm, building a, a rock wall um, when the census taker came around in that civil district, and. Um, um, he didn't have enough integrity to um, to say, "Oh, I already reported myself." So, or since this, uh, I, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, yeah, could could be um, the um, uh, also the census takers um, got paid somehow by the number of people they censused. So um, um, that's not a good system. So they're laying on the ground shooting. Are they shooting at? Specific, or they throwing... they're, they're just throwing lead in that direction. The lead's being, being thrown back at them. General. But to, to rearm, you've got to roll over on your yep. back. Yep. Mm -hmm. re re yep. 
Load it. Hold it back. Yep. <laughs> Putting and firing a um, uh, Enfield rifle musket from the prone is um, is possible, but not easy. And they stay here until four thirty or so. No, they're they're here about an hour. Um, when between casualties and um, consumption of ammunition, um, they then are um, going to uh, to fall back. So, yeah. Well, well how many... the same thing that Deshler does, doesn't he? Falls back with the main body and leaves the skirmish line. Um, uh, yeah, but the skirmish line is back. Back it's front. not on the crest. It's not, uh, it's not here, so right. it's okay. back closer to where they start. So. About how many rounds could they fire before they had to take the musket back and clean it out and come back? Yeah, um, that the um, some soldiers complain about the uh, the weapons becoming um, fouled um, with just a, a few rounds. Um, other soldiers don't seem to complain about it at all. Um, um, uh, some of it really depends on um, the quality of the ammunition. Um, the um, uh, if the mini ball was um, was well lubricated. Um, they, um, they were dipped in tallow, um, and in fact, the rings on the mini balls were not so that we could tell a Union mini ball from a Confederate <laughs> mini ball. Um, the, the rings were designed to, um, to hold some uh, tallow. Um, they, they would be stood up on their base and in a basin, and then um, a hot liquid tallow would be poured in, and they'd then be set out. So, so there would be a coating of tallow on the outside of the, uh, the mini ball and the rings were to hold a little bit. Um, so if they were well lubricated, um, and if they were sized properly, and here it's Hyman's division, um, and Lee, which brigade is it? Is it Anderson's brigade? Yeah. That complains they got a whole bunch of 5.77 and 58 caliber ammunition, which was too big to go down the bore of, um, of, their, uh, of their rifles. It was oversized. Um, like 59. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was like 59 or something. Um, and so, so if the 577 or 58 caliber round was um, was made small enough to begin with, that actually reduces the fouling somewhat. And um, the um, because there it is undersized, it then will go down. Actually, kind of scour some of that um, fouling. Um, of course, the Federals try to um, to use the William Cleaners um, rounds, um, the um, but the, the weapons could become fouled very easily. Um, and, but a lot of it seems to have um, de depended upon the quality of the ammunition. So. We should say the Confederate powder was in general pretty good, yeah. very good. Yeah, the powder, the Confederate powder burns very cleanly. Relative.